Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist minister and social activist who led the civil rights movement in the United States from the mid-1950s until his death by assassination in 1968. His leadership was fundamental to the movement's success in ending the legal segregation of African Americans in the South and other parts of the United States. King rose to national prominence as the head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which promoted nonviolent tactics, such as the massive march on Washington in 1963 to achieve civil rights. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1964. So much of his work and heart for people was impacted by his faith and his understanding that the message of the gospel truly is for all people. And he longed for the day when a man would be judged not by the color of his skin, but by the content of his character. In the midst of violence and turmoil, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. fought for equality for all Americans and his legacy of standing for civil rights continues today. Martin Luther King was superhuman. He was just a man, flawed and not without fault, but profoundly effective in the gospel ministry by the work of the Holy Spirit, helping him to see the supernatural things of God in his life and ministry. Yeah, amen. Grateful. Grateful for those that have gone before us and been testimonies of hearing from God and being obedient. Martin Luther King was truly a light. Uh, and I, I just want to say that someone here is also taking that, that vision of being a light in the darkness to our world. You have a Nissan Xterra. It's green. It's in the visitor parking. Your lights are on. I didn't know how else to tell it. Just thought I'd try to say something funny. So in about 30 seconds, if you own a green, oh, there he is, all right. I was trying to not to embarrass you, you know what I'm saying? I was, just, I was trying to not to embarrass you, but hey, uh, well, if you're watching today with us, welcome. We're glad to, that you could be with us today as, as uh, we continue to look at how we, who were born not superhuman, can do super things for God. Uh, Martin Luther King, did you know that that's not his name? His name was Michael King. His dad was Michael King Sr. He was born Michael King Jr. His dad was a Baptist pastor in, in Atlanta, Georgia at a Ebenezer Baptist Church and went to the Baptist World Con Congress uh, in 1934. And while he was there, he was deeply impacted by what he learned in the history of Martin Luther, who was the great spiritual uh, reformer of the Catholic Church. And, led into the Great Reformation. He came back as a pastor and decided to change his name as an adult to Martin Luther King Sr. And then uh, at, that was at the age of five for Martin Luther King Jr. Wanted his son to change his name. His son didn't change his name officially till he was 27. Now, these guys were just normal people. Martin Luther King Jr. wasn't effective because he was assigned by the President of the United States the responsibility of being racial reconciliation uh, coordinator or director. He didn't have a spot on the cabinet of the United States government. He was a man following a dream that God had put inside of his heart, a dream that came from Scripture, that no longer will we, there be male nor female, nor slave nor free, nor barbarian or Scythian, but that all would be seen as equal in the eyes of God. That truth from the word of God changed his vision and his direction for his life and should change every one of ours as well. And I, I want to challenge you today as we, we're going to look at a guy named uh, Saul and a guy named Samuel. Saul was the appointed king, the appointed leader of the people of Israel, Samuel was the man that God was using to, to influence and impact the people of Israel. And we're going to compare and contrast their leadership and how God called and used them, but specifically how Samuel was used by God. So let's go, Lord, in prayer, and then we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you that you are the God of all creation. And that every person that's in this room and every person listening online, Lord, you have called all of us 
to lead someone. You've called all of us to follow you. We don't always listen and we don't always follow God. But I pray, Lord, my, my humble prayer this morning, God, is that literally you would speak to everybody in this room. Lord, that you would nudge us further down the field in our faith. You would draw us tighter to you and knit us closer together with you and that you would lead us into something that we will be a little bit scared to do because it's gonna stretch us. And then you'll use us, God, to impact this world so that our, our nieces, our nephews, our kids, our grandkids will have a better world than what we have. Pray that in Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you got your, uh, your Bibles, go ahead and pull them out. We're gonna start in 1 Samuel chapter one. 1 Samuel, now, we're going through the Bible from cover to cover. We're reading from Genesis to Revelation, and we're glad that you're joining with us. If your family doesn't yet have a chronological Bible, we have them out on the table when you leave today because we want you to join in this journey with us. A lot of folks say, oh yeah, I believe the Bible, I've read parts of the Bible, but to read the whole thing from cover to cover, you get a different perspective. We're reading in Samuel right now, and Samuel's a bit of a challenging book because you're reading about these, these kings and, and these leaders that aren't such great people, and my wife and I were talking about that last night. She's like, did you read what Samson did? How did God bless that guy? He was such a scoundrel. And I'm like, yep, I get it. I said, that's just how, how tough it is when nations leave their belief that there is a creator, a master, a judge that they will be accountable to. People leave that, then they choose to live their life any way they want to. It gets ugly quick. And I feel like we're seeing a lot of that in our nation and in our culture today, where we're throwing off the values of the word of God and we're just living this life willy-nilly based on what we think is a good idea. That's why we gotta go back to the word of God. So the first thing I want you to see in this uh, passage, we're gonna start in verse one, is I want you to see how Hannah calls out to God in her pain. Now, we're not gonna read the whole thing. We're gonna start at verse nine, but Hannah is crying out to God because she has been unable to have children. And so she is seen here at the tabernacle praying and asking God for a miracle. So verse nine, uh, chapter nine, yeah, verse nine, chapter one. It says, once after a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up and went to pray. Eli the priest was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish, crying bitterly as she prayed to the Lord, and she made this vow. O Lord of heaven's armies, if you'll look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. He will be yours for his entire lifetime. And as a sign that he's been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. As she was praying to the Lord, Eli watched her. Seeing her lips moving but hearing no sound, he thought she'd been drinking. Must you come here drunk, he demanded. Throw away your wine. Oh no, sir, she replied. I haven't been drinking wine or anything stronger, but I am very discouraged. And I was pouring out my heart to the Lord. Don't think I am a wicked woman, for I have been praying out of anguish and sorrow. In that case, Eli said, go in peace. May the God of Israel grant the request you have asked of him. Oh, thank you, sir, she exclaimed. Then she went back and began to eat again, and she was no longer sad. So the first point on, my, on the listening God, if you have that with you, is that superhuman pain put in the hands of God leads to superhuman leaders. Hannah was going through superhuman pain. Some of you families out there have felt that pain. You prayed and you've asked the Lord for a child and you haven't received the answer to your prayer. 
Some of you have prayed for healing in your marriage, and it seems to only get worse. Others have prayed and asked God for a miracle health-wise, for you or for someone else. Hannah was in that situation. She didn't know where else to turn. Her and her husband were unable to have kids, and in that culture, that was deeply tied to the worth or the self-worth of a woman to provide the, the child. And that was also the retirement system, by the way, that when they get old, the children took care of the parents. And so Hannah was experiencing a life without that hope. And so what does she do? She comes to the Lord. She comes to the tabernacle and she's weeping before God. And she's crying out before God and she's seeking after God saying, Lord, please. She's so emotional that the priest, uh, Eli there, thinks that she is drunk because of the way she's behaving. And then as they, they have that conversation, he realizes she isn't, that she is genuinely lamenting her situation. I want to ask you, when was the last time you genuinely just poured your heart out to God and you just said, Lord, you know it. You know my hurt. You know my brokenness. I just need you to intervene. Uh, Honestly, that's the reason we started opening up the altar at the end of each service. We wanted to provide an, an opportunity for you to to every week have that opportunity just to communicate with God in a real way. Can you do that while you're sitting or standing in your seats? Of course you can. But there is something supernatural about coming and just laying it all before God, just physically making that point to say, God, I'm all in. I, I give you everything. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know where the next step may be, but Lord, I'm, I'm surrendering it all. Hannah was willing to do that. She gave her pain that was so great over to God and said, God, I can't carry it anymore. I need you and your help. Some of you are in that place right now. You're wrestling over something. There's a hurt, a burden, a weight that's there. And you may say, Steve, I've already done what Hannah's done. Then press on, brother. Press on, sister. Don't give up. Press on and keep asking and seeking. We don't know how long it was between Hannah crying out for a child and Hannah having her prayer answered. But she took her pain to God and that provided superhuman leadership. Oftentimes, God wants to use your pain of your past. He wants to redeem it to help other people going through that same pain in the future. If you find most people who are called to work with those in addiction, most have gone through addiction. When we have the Cookville Pregnancy Clinic, most people that, not all, but most that that feel led to work with that are women that have been through abortions and found healing and want to, to give back to other women or women that have challenges in their pregnancy and want to give back to other women. Over and over again, you see people that have found victory through Christ in crisis are called to go back and help those still in crisis. And some of you are here today and God's been speaking to you to do the same thing. He's been nudging you and you've been like, oh no, not me, God, I'm not, I don't have all the answers, I don't know everything, I'm not the right guy. And I hope and pray today that the Lord will prick your heart again, remind you of that dream or that idea that you had and begin to press into you what it is that he's calling you to. Well, let's look, look further at uh, chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. This is the first time that Samuel hears the voice of God. And again, I'm going to be jumping from a little bit of story to a little bit of story, a little bit of story, just because how much time we have. It's pretty hard preaching through the whole Bible in a year. I'm just saying, feel my pain, pray for me, right? There's so much good stuff. It, I started to preach on Jonathan this week. Uh, I love some of the stories about Jonathan and just felt like the Lord shifted me to Samuel. So uh, so 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 says, Meanwhile, the boy Samuel served the Lord by assisting Eli. Now in those days, messages from the Lord were very rare and visions were quite uncommon. 
One night, Eli, who was almost blind by now, had gone to bed. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was sleeping in the tabernacle near the ark of God. Suddenly, the Lord called out, Samuel. Yes, Samuel replied, what is it? He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, Eli replied. Go back to bed. So he did. Then the Lord called out again, Samuel. Again, Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am, did you call me? I didn't call you, my son, Eli said. Go back to bed. Samuel did not yet know the Lord because he had never had a message from the Lord before. So the Lord called a third time, And once more, Samuel got up and went to Eli, here I am, did you call me? So here God is calling Samuel, and and if you follow the story on out, Eli says, it's not me, it's the Lord, you need to listen, and he did. Now, I kind of think it would be cool if I heard the audible voice of God. I I, I never have, but I I really think it'd be kind of cool, but then I kind of think maybe the Lord knows it would scare me to death. Like, I, I might just have a heart attack on the spot, you know? It's like if the Lord actually spoke to me. So, personally, I'm just telling you, I've never heard the audible voice of God, but I know plenty of people that have. I've never had a vision, a dream like we read about in the Bible, but I know people that have. It still happens today, and, and maybe that's something God's done in your life. Maybe you've had a vision and a dream, and, but, but what God does in my life is he speaks to me daily as I pray the Holy Spirit will nudge me in my heart and, and nudge me to do something, to call somebody, to encourage somebody, to send a letter, to, to send a note, to, to send an email. He nudges me to pray with people at department stores. And sometimes it can be awkward because I don't know the people and I'll just see something and the Spirit of God will say, you need to go and, and pray with that person. I'm like, where's Brian Vaughn? He, he's good at that, Lord. You need somebody else, right? And we we want to find somebody else to do it for us because it scares us. So how do you know if it's God speaking to you or if it's Taco Bell from lunch, right? And it's like something's moving inside of there and I'm just not sure what it is. How do you know if it's the the Holy Spirit or just a crazy idea in your head? Because I get a lot of ideas. Uh, One of the things our, our team will tell you, they have to... They have to help me process sometimes whether this is an idea from the Lord or an idea from Stephen, right? Because sometimes the two can get a little confused. Well, with Eli, Eli helped Samuel understand this is the voice of God, go back and listen. I got set free just, I don't know, maybe six months ago, I told you that I read a book and and, uh, the pastor said he uses the 51% rule. And that was just so refreshing. I never thought of that. I always thought it had to be like 100%, like this is the voice of God. I am moving forward with power because it, I clearly heard from the Lord like, like Samuel. He said it's 51% for him. As long as it's biblical, you know, like something that God would tell someone to do or something God has told someone to do, something righteous, you know, to do, not like go and get revenge on the person that, uh, you know, got the promotion that you didn't, go and get revenge and try to backstab and get them fired. That's not a God, right? That's of the flesh. But if it's of God, like, hey, go pray with that person. Go encourage that person. Go pay for that person's meal. Go pay for that person's groceries. If it's more than 51%, like, you know what? I, I think that, that might be from the Lord. Just go do it. If it's a good thing, I think there's... So many things we don't do because we're so concerned about, is it really God? But it's a good thing anyway. Does that make sense? And and so I just want to encourage you the 51% rule. If you feel nudged to do something good for somebody, something that honors God, something that's biblical, just say, yes, Lord, and do it and let the chips fall where they may. And it doesn't always turn out the way you think it should. Sometimes if you do something for God, it can still wind up very awkward. Okay, so I was at my church in California and had a lady that came and, and uh, joined our church and, and I said, hey, can you share with me your salvation experience, how you came to know Jesus? She said, I can. She said, it was, uh, it was very interesting. I said, well, tell me your story. She said, I was riding the subway in Chicago and this young man just sat down across from me and he just very plainly said, ma'am, can I tell you about Jesus? And she said, I came from a 
historically Christian background. And she said, I was okay with Jesus. She said, sure. So he began to tell me about what it meant to be born again, to give your life to Christ and to follow him. And she said, that was different than the experience I grew up with. And she said, I I told him that it's okay. I'm a member of this denomination and that I'm good. And he proceeded to tell me being a member of a church doesn't save you, that Jesus saves you. She said, then I began to get offended because he, he said that, that, that I wasn't a Christian because I just believed in a church and not in Jesus. And she said, I began to get upset and gave him pushback. And he read to me out of the Bible that, that he, Jesus told Nicodemus that that doesn't work, that you gotta believe in Jesus and, and, and that you must be born again. And she said, I left her angry. And she said, I told him where he could go and I gave him directions to get there. And she said, when I left her, I was mad and offended at this guy. She said, but when I left her, I couldn't shake it. It just kept, those Bible verses, she said, kept rattling around in my head and I started thinking, well, what if he's right? And what if this shell of religion that I have is nothing more than than a shell? And so she went to the denomination she'd been a part of and, and presented the, the passage to the, uh, the leader of that congregation and said, hey, this is what was told to me. What does it mean to be born again? And the priest at where she was uh, attending on Christmas and Easter said, I don't know anything about being born again. And she said, I didn't get my answers. And so I went and got a Bible and started seeking And then I went to a little church down the street and I got a chance to talk to the pastor there and he he walked me through what the other man had told me, that Jesus Christ came and paid the price for my sins. And if I confess Christ with my mouth and turn away from my sins, that I too could be born again into this relationship with him. And she said, I wanted that. And that day I gave my life to Christ. And she was walking with the Lord. She was on fire for the Lord. And, and yet this young man that had felt prompted to share his faith with her, what do you think his impression was of that situation when he left? I failed. I failed. All I did was hurt her feelings. She left there and didn't understand. I failed. And that nothing could be further from the truth. He planted the seed The Holy Spirit watered her, and then it bore fruit in her salvation. So I say that to tell you that sometimes even when you're obedient and you say, yes, Lord, and you do what he tells you to do, it may not result in the outcome that you thought it would result in when he told you to do it. I stand here with a book, Moon Over My Shoulder, uh, from Kay Powell in our church. She's been telling me for years, I know God's telling me to write a book, a devotional book. I know God's putting these ideas in my head. I got to write this. And she, she came to me and I was like, you need to pursue that. You need to pursue that. And she put it together and got it published. And I'm just proud of her because she took the time and the energy to say, yes, Lord, to something. She said, I've never been a writer. I don't know why, but I'm going to say, yes, Lord. What is it that God's been prompting you to do? What area has he been speaking to you about to say, yes, Lord? Maybe it's serving in an area that you had a deep wound in. And he's telling you now it's time to get involved in the solution instead of the problem. Maybe it's a neighbor that just needs a a word of encouragement. Maybe it's gonna be today as you leave for the Holy Spirit's gonna prompt you to go pay for somebody's lunch or, or pay for somebody's gas. That'll be a... Small business loan. (laughs) Whatever it is. I just want to challenge you to say, yes, Lord, as Samuel did, to say, yes, Lord. All right. Third thing, compare and contrast. I want to compare and contrast the leadership of Samuel and Saul. Now, Saul was the king. Samuel was a prophet and a judge. 
He had no official capacity. Saul had all the official capacity. And I think oftentimes we as people, we're waiting for the people with the official capacities to do something about the problem. When the truth is, if the Holy Spirit dwells inside of you and the Holy Spirit nudges you and says, you need to take control on that, you need to take action. I know somebody else gets paid to do that job, but they ain't doing it. It's time for you to step up and lead. And when the Holy Spirit prompts you to do that, that's your chance to say, yes, Lord whatever that might be. And other people around you may not even affirm you in that decision. They may, maybe, they may be like, you? <laughs> you? Seriously? Why, you were an orphan dropped off at the tabernacle. We are sons of the priest. You? God's not speaking to you, Samuel, really? Now, me, I have an official title. The people will listen to me. Here's what I'll tell you. When God puts something on you and you say, yes, Lord, then you no longer need a title. You have the authority of the Holy Spirit and you can walk it out and see God move mountains. So in 1 Samuel 15, I'm just gonna walk you through this. Verse by verse, we're just gonna compare Samuel and Saul. Now, understand Saul is the king and God has told Saul, again, this, there's more reading behind this. I'm hoping you're reading with me each week. So God has told Saul that there's a people that they have been uh, opposing the Israelites and God says, I'm gonna bring judgment upon them for their evil. So he says, Saul, I want you to go and take your army and I want you to get rid of them. I want you to, to go to war and wipe them out so they will never bring this, this garbage again to the people, okay? And so off he goes, off Saul goes to lead the army, but God gives them specific instructions. Don't leave anyone or anything alive. It is so evil, I don't want any part of any of that brought back into the camp. So what does Saul do? He goes into battle, and he brings the best spoils of war back. And he brings the king back. Not sure why he brought the king, but the best spoils of war he brought to plunder he says it was for God, but God knows his heart, right? Okay, so let's compare this. So Samuel has to confront him. Verse 10, 1 Samuel 15, starting in verse 10. It says, then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me, and he has refused to obey my command. So that's how we know that Saul wasn't doing this for God, he was doing it for himself. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Now this is the sign of someone who's a God follower. Samuel is crying out to the Lord all night. Whether that's literal, physical weeping to intercede for Saul or whether it is him praying, saying, Lord, don't know what the future is, but God, please intervene for our people. Give me wisdom as I speak to Saul. We don't know exactly what he was crying out for, but just the fact that he's crying out all night, okay? Verse 12, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Let me just pause there. Samuel said yes. God is calling Samuel, who has no official title, to go to the most powerful man in the country and basically say, Saul, you have sinned against God. So he obeys. Someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself, then he went on to Gilgal. That's what insecure leaders do. They have to drum up the support of everybody and point the attention to themselves. If you are a leader that are, and you're more concerned about the plaques on your walls than the prayers in your heart, then you're missing it. If you're a leader and you're making sure that wherever you lead, everybody is recognizing and giving you the credit for the achievement, then you're an insecure leader and you need to repent. You see, Samuel didn't need the attention. He was leading from behind. 
And oftentimes people say you can't lead from behind. You can only lead if you're the official leader. It's not true. If you are leading from the authority of God, you can lead from any position on the team. Next we see in uh, verse 13, it says, when Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. Liar, liar, pants on fire. Saul starts the conversation by no, you ever feel guilty and feel like you gotta sell somebody that, that you're innocent, right? That's what he's doing. He's immediately trying to sell him right here that he's innocent. Verse 14, then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear, Samuel demanded. I can almost hear sarcasm in his voice. I don't know that it's there, but I'm a fairly sarcastic person. So I can almost hear them having this dialogue and Saul goes, hey, it's going really good. And Samuel's like, oh really? What's that I hear? Is not that the bleeding of sheep? Then how could you be obedient, Saul? It's true that the army spared the, the army, not him. He had nothing to do with it. These guys, it's true the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they're going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We've destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. Now that's courageous leadership. When you're willing to challenge the power and authority over you with truth, that brings about change. Now, interestingly enough, we don't see him doing it in front of everybody else. This is one-on-one, because we see later on, he, he actually shows grace to Saul. But in this moment, he's confronting him. What did he tell you, Saul asked? And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they're all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? But I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me, I brought back King Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Then my troops, they brought back, the word they is not in there, but then my troops brought back and the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. But Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or obedience to his voice? I could pause there. What is more important to God that you show up on Sunday morning and you drop money in the plate or that Monday through Sunday you love God, you love people, and you impact the world? God's more concerned with our obedience and our love than all the stuff we can do to try to look good for him. It's the heart. You know the motive of your heart. Samuel was trying to get down to Saul's motives. And what is Saul doing? He's deflecting. He's blaming his army. He's pretending like he was doing it all for good reasons. Listen, just because you do for a good reason something that is wrong doesn't make it right, right? And that's what Saul had done. And he says in verse 23, Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you've rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Now I'm just gonna address this one verse and uh, because I think this is a blind spot to our culture today, witchcraft. Witchcraft was seen the same as worshiping idols. Something pagans did that was greatly offensive to God. And we are dangerously close in our American culture to embracing witchcraft as good. There are a lot of kids' cartoons about it, a lot of stuff on kids' movies about it. There's a lot of books written about it. The celebration of witches and warlocks as having good abilities to help people with their witchcraft and their, listen, there's only two powers. Let me be clear. There's the power of God to do supernatural 
and the power of Satan to do supernatural. If it's not of God, it is of Satan. So I'm just going to say clearly, witchcraft is of the devil, and he wants to use it to capture your kids, your grandkids, your nieces, your nephews' hearts, and we need to run as far away from that as possible, okay? That's not what the whole text was addressing here, but I feel like as we walk through this, we need to see that because our culture is embracing witchcraft like I've never seen before. Good witches, white witches, they're all pointing people to a life that will lead to Satan because he wants you to believe in your supernatural power, you who you are, versus the power of God and his love and righteousness, okay? Then Paul, Saul then pleads for forgiveness. Maybe he has a change of heart here. Not sure if he's just trying to appease Samuel or what, but verse 24 says, then Saul admitted to Samuel, yes, I have sinned. I have disobeyed your instructions and the Lord's command, for I was afraid of the people and did what they demanded. Paul's there again. He's still blaming the people. Even in his apology and his repentance, he's still saying, you're, you're right, you're right. I shouldn't have done that. I sinned because the people, they were pressuring me so bad. If you're the leader, the buck stops there, okay? We need leaders that will say, Lord, I take responsibility and authority for my actions and not pointing to others and playing the blame game. Verse 25, but now please forgive my sin and come back with me so I may worship the Lord. But Samuel replied, I will not go back with you since you rejected the Lord's command. He has rejected you as king of Israel. As Samuel turned to go, Saul tried to hold him back and tore the hem of his robe. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel away from you today and has given it to someone else who is better than you. And he who is the glory of Israel will not lie, nor will he change his mind, for he is not human that he should change his mind. Then Samuel pleaded again, I know I've sinned, but please at least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel finally agreed and went back with him and Saul worshiped the Lord. Wow, what a mess, huh? Saul still worried about how the elders and the other people view him more than doing what's right before God. I just wanna challenge you, we wanna lead, we wanna lead like Samuel, not like Saul. And that leads into the last thing. We wanna lead like Jesus. Matthew 20. Now, we're gonna jump to the New Testament, okay? And Jesus is leading 12 disciples. He's leading them, he's teaching them, he's trying to mobilize them to take this good news to all nations. And yet there's this constant chatter amongst the disciples over who gets to be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. James and John are fussing about it and even their mama came to Jesus and, and tried to tried to ask Jesus for favor that her sons could be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. I don't know, guys. If you got to get your mama to go to your boss to try to get a promotion, you might want to just step back for a minute. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying. Okay? And then Peter, he tries to play himself off as better than the other. He's like, but Lord, if everybody else deserts you, Lord, you know I won't. I got your back, you and me. And Jesus says, you'll be the first to deny me three times, Peter. Okay, we gotta check our pride at the door. And then Jesus then spoke about how we should lead in our community, in our church, in our relationships, in our businesses, in our homes. He says, but among you, it should be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your what? Slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ came to teach us a different way. 
He came to teach us a different style of leadership. Not that that style hadn't been modeled previously by people like Samuel. But we still struggle with walking it out. I want to ask you just, just for a moment, what is it that God's been prompting you about? Is there something that he's been whispering to you in your prayers that's at that 51% that you're thinking, maybe that's God, maybe that's not? I want to challenge you to walk it out today. Maybe it's a career change. Maybe it's taking a class to help you become a better leader. Maybe it's making a phone call towards reconciliation to someone that you've had a broken relationship with. Maybe it's adoption of children that are needing to be adoption. Maybe it's becoming a foster parent. Maybe the Lord's been nudging you to say you need to go on a mission trip and, or consider being a full-time missionary. I don't know what the Lord's nudging you, but I want to challenge you to say yes to God today. I want to invite you to stand with me. Jimmy's going to come out and he's going to lead us in, in a simple song that uh, we've been singing for generations as a church about hearing what the Savior says to us. And we're going to open the altar up for a time for you to, to come and say yes to the Lord. Maybe the Lord's leading you to, to jump in somewhere and you've been holding back. I want to challenge you to just come and kneel today and say, Lord, I'm all in. Whatever it is that he's nudging you to do, just come and say you're all in. Or maybe you're needing to ask somebody about some wisdom have somebody pray with you about something or something you're walking through. On the right side over here, if you come and kneel up here, someone will pray with you. As you kneel, one of our pastors or ministers will come and, and they'll pray with you and whatever that is. On the left side, it's between you and the Lord, whatever you want to work on. And then in the middle, I'll be here. And if you're here today and maybe you've got religion, but you've never been born again, You've never stepped across that line and said, I want to give my whole life to Christ. I'll be there. I'll be there in the middle to receive you. And then for everybody that doesn't feel you're, you're at the 49% the or less, you don't feel like the Lord's prompting you, then pray for those that he is. And, and sing, sing over them that they would say, yes, Lord, whatever that is. Maybe God's speaking to you. Maybe, maybe it's about baptism. You know, we're going to offer baptism Easter Sunday. Maybe you just need to come and say, okay, Lord, I'm in. Whatever it is, as Jimmy leads us, we'll be down front. Jesus paid it all 
continues to play in the background. I just want to tell you the invitation still open. There's also a prayer room in the back. Maybe you just need to talk with somebody and have a couple of minutes to unpack that in a private setting. Uh, we have the prayer room back there with a husband and wife couple willing to pray with you and encourage you on whatever that might be. As people come, just continue to pray that God moves as he wants to move today, that our hearts will be open. So much for checking us out online. Hey, here at the River Community Church, we would love to connect with you. So if you go to online.therivercc.com, you're going to find lots of buttons. And I don't know about you, but I love buttons. And on, just click those buttons. There you can connect with us. You can, if you have prayer requests, you can share those. You can uh, watch us live, find out more about our church. Even if you want to give, you can give uh, by pushing some of those buttons. So make sure you check out onlive.therivercc.com. Hey, and also be sure to check out our YouTube channel. Uh, just search for the River Community Church, find our logo, and there you can catch up on messages that you might have missed. And when you're there, make sure you subscribe and then share that with your friends. Hey, thanks again for checking us out online.